welcome to Adventures in Alchemy, a podcast filled with witchy tips and true stories to inspire your magical life. I am Michelle Martin Dobbins, the creator of Daily Alchemy and the Adventures in Alchemy podcast. This podcast is supported by the Daily Alchemy Premium Members Lab. I don't run a Patreon, so I keep membership at a very economical 11 11 a month. For that, you not only help sponsor this podcast, but you will receive access to 14 alchemy courses, and we add a new course each quarter, access to Reiki Level 1, 2, and Master's training and distance attunements, plus a library of audio distance Reiki healings, monthly alchemical experiments, PDFs of all my books and planners, and 15% off of everything else I sell. Also, there's a members-only Facebook group so we can chat amongst ourselves in a private community. So when you join, I do ask that you commit to three months since you are able to access and download all of the content immediately. It's $33.33 for the first three months and then $11.11 every month after. I am so grateful to all the premium members who support my work and I'd love to have you as a premium member too if you're not already one. You can go to DAPM Lab, that stands for Daily Alchemy Premium Members Lab, DAPMLab.com to check it out, or there'll be a link in the show notes. Now, on with the show, and may it be a blessing to all who listen. All right, everybody, I am so excited today because I have an amazing guest here. I have Dr. Carolyn Elliott. And she is the author of Existential Kink, Unmask Your Shadow, and Embrace Your Power, and also the cult favorite creativity book, Awaken Your Genius. And through her online programs, she's helped thousands of people dramatically transform their lives using shadow integration and applied occult philosophy. She leads the Game of Sovereigns Existential Kink Coach Training Program and speaks at events and conferences internationally. So, hello, Carolyn. I am so glad to have you here. Hi, Michelle. Thank you for having me. This is wonderful. You're welcome. And I will go ahead and tell everyone that I'm kind of a fangirl of all your work and I've taken most of your classes. So I'm really excited to talk to you. Mm -hmm. And I think our main topic is going to be why your manifestation practice hasn't been working. So... Why do you think most people have problems in that area? We'll just dive into the. Oh, this is one of my favorite topics. Okay, so the way that manifestation is largely taught is that it only focuses on one side of the equation. So my understanding of magic, and I come from a Western esoteric background, is that there's always a twofold process. So in this term comes from alchemy, and the term is solve et coagula. So that's Latin, and what that means is to dissolve and then to recombine. Solve, dissolve, coagula, recombine, like coagulate. So most all manifestation teachings focus on the coagula part. So coagula is when you kind of bring together a new vision of what you want and you put energy into that. Right. So like vision boards and all that kind of thing that we do. Affirmations, vision boards, that's kind of... Oh yeah. All of that stuff. Spells, rituals, visualization, everything like that. That's all coagula. And the thing is, is that it can work. It especially can work if you happen to have some free energy in your system, in your sphere of being, and you channel that energy into the coagula process, you can end up seeing some pretty awesome manifestations, which, you know, usually manifestation works at least part of the time for people, Mm -hmm. especially uh, people who are interested enough to listen to podcasts like these. (laughs) We can make it work, but it doesn't feel reliable. There's always a catch. And I got really curious about this myself because I would, you know, read all the law of attraction books. I was really into um, New Thought and Florence Shovel Shin. Wait, am I getting that right? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I do. She was awesome, Florence. Mm -hmm. And all of these texts about, you know, creative visualization, affirmation, everything like that. 
So I did get results and I did get progress, but it was not really satisfying to me. In some cases, it was actually kind of scary what I manifested. <laughs> I've had those experiences too. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So I started to get really curious about this. And I realized, oh, we're missing the solve part. So solve is when it's simply when you dissolve the old patterns that were previously in place. So for example, with money magic, you can do the most fantastic Jupiter spell in the world. So Jupiter is the planetary deity that I would work with that I have worked with for money magic in many cases. And you can have the most perfect Jupiter talisman. You can have the most perfect affirmations and visualizations of your wealth. And none of it can work if you have patterns inside of you that are attached to scarcity and are attached to feeling like you have to prove yourself or you have to work super hard or all of these different things. So, it's important to dissolve those usually unconscious patterns and liberate the energy that's trapped in them before you try to recoagulate <laughs> something else. Right. Because when you do the solve first, number one, you have that liberated creative energy that you can then invest in something else. And number two, you open the space in your being to receive what you're asking for. So, yeah. Do you have any thoughts about that, Michelle? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. It kind of, in the book, you talk about not really being a big fan of the law of attraction. And I've never really liked that term either because, you know, it's like something's missing. And you were kind of explaining in your book that half of half of um, the process of alchemy is missing when you do just focus on law of attraction. So what kind of practices have you found that actually work that give us that other half of the missing piece? Yeah. So my favorite solve practice, of course, is existential kink, which is what my book is about. And it's a practice of Basically setting aside 15 minutes, you know, setting a timer, creating a little container for yourself, laying down somewhere where you won't be disturbed and gently allowing yourself to get in touch with the part of you that desires and enjoys some situation in your life that your ego mind tells you that you really don't like. So my example for this, the way that I discovered this process was I was sort of stuck making about $1,500 a month or less. I couldn't seem to make more than that. I was pretty much the first decade of my adult life. That was how much they paid me when I was a graduate student. And that was how it seemed to be the ceiling on how much I could earn when I was doing freelance writing. And it was so frustrating. And I remember, you know, feeling like, oh my gosh, I'm so humiliated. This is so awful. I have to like scramble all the time to figure out how I'm going to pay my bills. Other people I know seem to be so much more successful than me. What is going on here? And eventually one day it occurred to me, hey, I wonder if I keep recreating this situation because some part of me really, really enjoys it. And what if I just embraced that part of me? What if I just gave so much approval, so much love to that secret bit of me that really, really loves this and just let her enjoy it, let her receive all the enjoyment that she has in these feelings of humiliation, these feelings of anxiety, of needing to prove myself and needing to figure it all out again this month so I don't just slide into ruin. (laughs) The whole drama, what if I just love it and be honest with myself about how much I love it instead of acting like I hate it so much and it's such a burden? And so I started practicing this and I found that it was incredible. I, it was, there were actual like literal genital orgasms attached to allowing myself to go into this enjoyment. And I realized that it was kinky and that Mm -hmm. I didn't just have a bedroom kink, you know, because that's fairly socially acceptable these days. (laughs) Into BDSM and whips and chains, you know, people create negotiated scenes with their partners and they have safe words and that's all hip and cool. 
but to have an existential kink, an internal kink, where I actually unconsciously desired scarcity (laughs) and enjoyed it. Well, that's just weird. That's really weird. And that's really freaky. And so it took a lot of determination for me to give myself permission to go ahead and enjoy that very, very taboo feeling. And part of why I wrote my book is because I want to make it easier for people who have similar things that they want to work on to understand that actually, you know, I've studied and read a lot of psychology, a lot of of the founding fathers of psychology, and this idea that humans unconsciously really, really enjoy things that are super taboo to our ego minds. And our egos, of course, are the part of us that we usually identify with. They're the part of us that wants to survive and wants to have lots of good stuff and feel good and be respected and everything like that. That's just one part of us. And the rest of us (laughs) is interested in a lot of other stuff, has a lot of other desires that aren't compatible with the ego's desires that maybe some of them aren't even compatible with safety and survival. And so they can be very, very hard to give approval to. But I guess what I want people to understand is that these kind of contrary, perverse, taboo, shadow desires exist within every single one of us. And there's no point being ashamed of them or blaming yourself for having them or anything like that, because they're just an inevitable part of being human. And the faster we become willing to recognize them and celebrate them and bring them out into the open, we can actually dissolve their power (laughs) because a conscious desire has much, much less generative power to shape your life than an unconscious desire. So the quote that I always like to think of comes from Carl Jung, a great pioneer of psychology. And he said, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will rule your life and you will call it fate. And I just think that's so true. I think, you know, we all know people who seem like they've been in various kinds of ruts for really long times. They just keep repeating the same patterns in their relationships, their work, their health. And they're not necessarily great patterns, but folks seem pretty stuck in them. And I think it has to do with the fact that most people never make their taboo unconscious desires conscious. They just keep thinking that they hate what they hate. And, you know, there's that catchy saying, what you resist persists. I think it might have been Wayne Dyer who coined that, but it is so, so true. And so we, our ego usually resists what our unconscious desires create. It's like, oh, this is so awful. I can't stand this. How do I get rid of this? (laughs) But it's exactly that attitude that will keep the thing occurring again and again and again. So what I'm saying is we can find a way to give shameless, freaky, kinky, sexy permission to the part of ourselves that enjoys dark, taboo, scary things that creates them in our lives. Just enjoy what we're creating. And when we do that, we liberate the energy that was trapped in that pattern. And we make that energy available to create a new, more beautiful pattern. That makes so much sense. I think I know for myself, it's so much easier to actually, like when I think about it, see that pattern in other people. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Of course it always is, right? And you'd be like, I know that they're enjoying that drama. I mean, I think we all have that friend relative (laughs) who can't wait to call and tell us like what new horrible thing the doctor discovered or what new horrible thing their mother-in-law did, you know, and you're like... Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know you're enjoying it, but then you have to kind of turn those tables and <laughs> start to see it for yourself. And I think you're also saying that there are going to be those parts, those things that we enjoy that happen in our life that we could never like consciously enjoy, but still there is that shadow part of us who must like it or it wouldn't be there. Yeah. Well, so this is where things can get very challenging because something that I do talk about in my book to help people find out what their unconscious desires are without having to go through 30 years of psychotherapy or dream work, I like to tell people having is evidence of wanting. Just look at what's going on in your life and you can know that a part of you is 
desires it, finds it compelling, finds it fascinating, or else it wouldn't be there. And of course, this notion can be very offensive, especially when people have experienced trauma, when they're experiencing great hardship. And of course, the thing is, it's not just our personal unconscious that's attracted to dark, scary stuff. It's the collective unconscious, and the collective mm-hmm. exists within each and every one of us. So things like you know, vast economic inequality, corporatism, racism, sexism, child abuse, those are absolutely collective shadows. And they can affect us as individuals. Obviously, many of us are terribly affected by these. But they don't exist completely outside of us. They're not something that's just being done to us. They are also something partly happening inside of us. So there are possibilities of going to very deep places with this work. Even, you know, to use a sort of simple example... Nobody wants to be sick, right? And nobody who isn't severely depressed wants to die, right? We want to live. We want to feel good. We want to be healthy. And that's how our egos view things. And of course, that's an absolutely necessary view of things. Like we need that. That's so great. But I believe that the whole of us, our whole soul is interested not just in the experience of being alive and healthy, but in the experience of decay and death and dying and illness. And it knows how to enjoy those things just as much as anything else. And if our soul wasn't interested in that, then we wouldn't have incarnated into this realm of duality. Because that's the order of the day, right? Birth and death, growth and decay. So I do believe that actually it is possible to even let ourselves enjoy very scary things that we ordinarily wouldn't, as long as we're reminding ourselves that, you know, it's our soul is already enjoying this. Our soul came here for this and it's okay to love it. It's okay to love the drama of being ill and what the doctor said and the new scary thing. It's okay to love the fact that we're all going to die and everybody that we love is going to die you can love that without being a monster (laughs) because it's just part of duality. And actually my greatest inspiration, I think the most amazing heroes of this kind of work are actually the Adams family. So if you watch the Adams family movies from the nineties, you'll see it's kind of fascinating because um, for example, Morticia Adams, she has a house that's exactly the kind of house that she likes. She has a wardrobe that's exactly the kind of wardrobe that she likes. She has a hot, passionate, committed relationship with her husband. She has close, playful relationships with her children. She has, you know, she fills her time doing exactly what she wants to do. She's respected by her community and her family. She's pretty much the happiest woman depicted in any, <laughs> anything, anywhere. Right? Yeah, that's true. And what does Morticia do? She gets off on everything. She gets off on death, on the possibility of death, on being tortured and held prisoner. She knows how to enjoy all of it and without seeing herself as a victim. And of course, she's a fictional character in a comedy universe. But I think we're actually all fictional characters in a comedy universe, at least, you know, a tragic comedy or whatever. There's yeah. <laughs> there's definitely a strong comedic element. <laughs> yeah, that makes total sense. Sometimes when I'm trying to kind of get like, how could I enjoy something that's terrible? I think of the fact that like, we're all part of the divine and the divine is obviously not afraid of anything because I kind of feel like the reason that we incarnate is just so that the divine can experience everything. Mm -hmm. Oh, well said, beautifully said. Yeah. I really think that that's true. And I think that part of the way that we hypnotize ourselves into forgetting that we are super divine, that we're immensely powerful. Part of the way that we put ourselves to sleep is by thinking that we are only these egos, we're only these bodies, and we can only enjoy what what's good for this body. <laughs> and we can only enjoy what makes our ego feel safe and bolstered. Actually, we have much greater range of enjoyment. And of course, it can take time and practice and commitment to work on expanding that range of enjoyment. 
But I think that there's a great reward in doing so because number one, you become more easily able to create the sort of world and experience that you would like because you, like we've been talking about, you liberate all of that unconscious erotic energy that was previously just caught up in the fun game of rejecting (laughs) your circumstances. Mm -hmm. And instead, you know, you can use that to create other things and you reclaim your divine identity, which that to me is why this path of alchemical transformation and magic is so amazing because not only can you create very tangible, practical results like more love, more money, more health, you grow into a non-dual realization of your union with your larger soul. And that's just so, so precious. Yeah, that makes total sense. So that's, I know one of the questions in your book, because you have a question and answer section, was kind of based around that. Like if someone had asked, what if I enjoy a sucky situation to the point of getting off on it, then why wouldn't I just keep the sucky situation going since I like it so much? Mm -hmm. So I guess once you're freeing up that energy, it leaves you open to enjoy things that you actually consciously want? Is that kind of how it works? Absolutely. So there's this funny paradox to it where when you really humble your conscious mind to what your unconscious mind is already enjoying, and as your conscious self, you sort of get down on your knees and you're like, okay, you win. I give you Mm -hmm. my total honor, my love. I'm here for you. I'm here to celebrate you. I like to think of it sort of like um, a courtly knight on his knees for his lady. (laughs) I'm here for you. You are what it's all about. I love you. I'm not going to act like I'm ashamed of you or I'm afraid of you. I'm just totally devoted to you and here to celebrate you. Okay. When the ego, when the conscious mind takes on that attitude towards our unconscious creations that we would usually label as negative and things that we don't like, like scarcity, rejection, humiliation, failure, there is an alchemy that happens. So the conscious mind has humbled itself into union with the unconscious mind. And in that moment of union, the unconscious actually gets fertilized by the conscious mind. So the unconscious is the feminine generative part of us. She's like a womb she receives information and she gives birth to it. She gestates it and then gives birth to it in the world as events, as synchronicities, so on. So when the conscious mind super humbles itself, there is that moment of union. And so, of course, all the things that we've been consciously desiring all along, like wealth, like health, like love, suddenly the unconscious is receptive to that, opens to that, and is like, yeah, let's do that now. And then we start generating those kinds of synchronicities. And it's so, so fascinating. It's almost like the change is inevitable. Like, (laughs) you can't stop it. Once you really get off on something, once you really love it and enjoy it, you're no longer resisting it, and it changes. So... I've never actually talked to somebody who's like, oh, I just enjoy this thing so much that I actually have kept it going. Actually, usually when I talk to them for a little bit, I find if they're keeping it going, there's usually some part of them that still is disapproving of it. That's like, oh, this is so terrible. I can't wait for this to be over. How do I get rid of this? And they're trying to use existential kink to get rid of the thing. And I understand that temptation, especially when I've presented it to you as something that's transformative. And the fact is, is that it is transformative. But if we use the technique with this attitude of like, oh, I'll do this existential kink and then I'll get rid of this scarcity and I won't have to deal with it anymore. (laughs) Yeah, I can feel like some part of me likes it, but ugh, I just can't wait to change it, right? That attitude doesn't work (laughs) because that's not a genuine humbling. That's like, I'm going to try to use this technique to fix myself. And the ego trying to fix itself is the whole the whole trouble. So it does take sort of a radical humility, a radical erotic surrender to just be like, look, 
the current state of affairs in my life. This is what I honestly, genuinely love. This is what my unconscious has already created. It's what's here anyways, and I'm just going to enjoy it and stop trying to fix it and stop trying to control it. Just for 15 minutes, I'm just going to totally celebrate it. That kind of attitude is what eventually produces change and what actually feels really amazing. And that's what I advocate that people do is just focus on the enjoyment itself. Like, don't worry so much about changing things in the future. Just give yourself permission to radically, momentously enjoy your life as it is. So I like to talk about all of this stuff from a fun, sexy, kinky angle because I'm weird like that. (laughs) But actually, there's another more kind of, you know, more wholesome way of looking at it. And if I had to explain it to a child, this is how I would explain it, is it's just a practice of being deeply, unconditionally grateful for absolutely everything in your life, even the stuff that you think you don't like. Mm, Yeah, that makes total sense. And that you can't do it from the perspective of trying to get rid of it because that's not actually being grateful. That's kind of trying to like trick the universe and that never. Exactly. So one of my favorite things to help me feel like just totally nailed in the moment is to really like literally imagine myself that I'm just in the tightest kind of bondage in this, whatever situation it is that I'm working on. So for example, you know, there's all of this lockdown and quarantine stuff going on. So I like to imagine this also helps me with my existential kink that the universe is my lover manifest reality is my lover. So whatever is happening in manifest reality It's always touching me perfectly and deeply at my most sensitive spots. It's always creating this astounding level of bliss sensation that I usually tune out and numb myself to, that we usually all tune out and numb ourselves to, but that it's possible to get in touch with that. And it's possible to just feel, you know, like (laughs) we're tied to our bedposts and our lover manifest reality is making love to us. And we've got nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. We're just completely nailed right here in this moment, being exquisitely touched by everything, by events, by people in our experience, the whole thing. So everything unfolding with all the, you know, fearfulness, with all the worry, with all the inconvenience and stress of not ordinary life not happening. All of those are strokes from my lover, the universe, and they're all stroking me at my most sensitive places. And am I willing to open up and experience those touches as pleasure? Am I willing to be turned on with them? Or am I like, no, I have to turn myself off. I don't like this. This is bad. I want things to go back to normal right now. (laughs) You know? So it's like that surrendering of control. Yes, absolutely. It is 1000% surrender. And it's bringing in that surrender. You know, you can have that, (laughs) you can have it in, um, I mean, I guess there's different flavors of surrender. And I'm talking about, I'm encouraging people to experiment with an erotic level of surrender to the divine, because I find that you know, especially spiritually oriented, good hearted people can get very abstract and very airy and kind of disconnected from their bodies, from their genitals, from their guts. But the fact of our divinity, you know, if we just have that as an abstract idea, it doesn't really do much. It doesn't really matter much unless it's a genital level, gut level knowing and way of responding to life. That makes sense. So when somebody actually dives in and surrenders this control and does this process, I know you have lots of people who've done that through your classes, like I'm sure like thousands of people. Mm -hmm. And you share some really cool stories in your book. Is there one of your favorites that you'd like to share? Like like the actual what happened for somebody when they Oh boy, let's see. Well, I think one of the stories I love is um, a woman, she was out of work for a long time and she had been a movie producer in the past and she just sort of 
felt, um, let's see if I might get stories mixed up with each other. I'm trying to remember one, but this might actually be <laughs> some combination of stories because I've, re- I've read thousands of them, but um, if I remember yeah. that one correctly. So she was just feeling really alienated from her industry and like she was disgusted by the men in the industry and everything about it and the way that she'd been treated and disrespected. And she thought to herself, you know, having heard about existential kink, she was like, you know what, this is a societal problem, but it's also an issue that's within me. You know, the collective is within me and there's some part of me that enjoys being disrespected like this. So she spent some time and she worked on those feelings of being disrespected and isolated and by her colleagues. And she worked on them, you know, just as if like she was in humiliation scenes with a dom. Hmm. And she found that she was able to access a lot of pleasure in those feelings. So she spent just about a week doing a daily practice of existential kink and getting off on those really intense feelings. And she had been out of work for like two years where she was just kind of scraping by with odd jobs because she couldn't her connections in the movie industry were really dried up because of the sexism that she had been facing. And within a week of doing this work and of like ecstatically getting off on the disrespect and the humiliation and all of this, you know, super gross, dark stuff, she got a call and it was an offer to be the producer of a mainstream movie. And she was like, yes, (laughs) I will do it. I'm coming on. So she came on and she's, you know, began working again. And she just turned around her whole situation so quickly just by being willing to surrender and get off on this very dark, very messed up thing that absolutely is not her fault, but is something within the world that exists and can be made conscious and enjoyed. That's awesome. And I, I love how you said, you know, it's not her fault. So it's kind of, you know, some people when they look at the law of attraction, they're like, oh, I attracted this to me. And I think that's not really what you're saying. You're just saying that, you know, obviously there's part of our own unconscious or the collective unconscious that enjoys it, but it doesn't mean that we've like had low vibrations and now it's our fault. It's just like, this is what's happening and we get to enjoy it and we get to you know, focus in and do this work and free up the energy again. Yeah, absolutely. So that is a difficult thing where precisely with the things that we're talking about, people can hear about it and be like, are you saying it's it was her fault that she experienced that discrimination? Or are you saying that it's my fault? And it's like, no, definitely not. Ne- it's never about fault. It's never about blame. It's never about shame. All of those attitudes, feeling at fault, blaming oneself, shaming oneself, those just keep things repressed. They just perpetuate things. So I really love a saying from 12-step recovery that I think is pertinent here, which is that um, you're not responsible for your disease, but you are responsible for your recovery. So, and of course, they're talking about the disease of addiction. And basically all of these things are like the disease of addiction. We are all addicted to whatever we're addicted to, to feeling oppressed, to feeling scarcity, to feeling like we're trapped, to feeling, you know, all sorts of stuff. And it's extremely human and we inherit it, you know, from our families, from society, from the collective. We didn't invent it (laughs) single-handedly. And so we're not responsible for it. But then again, nobody else can change it for us. Like I desperately wish that I could change, you know, like you were talking about the friend that calls you up and they're like, you can tell they're getting this weird enjoyment out of the terrible stuff that's happening to them. (laughs) And it's like, wow, I kind of wish that I could just reach over there and, you know, help you actually really get off on this with approval so that you can, fully digest that and move on to something else. Cause this is getting a little bit boring here listening to you. 
<laughs> you know, I passionately, desperately wish that I could do that, but I can't. It's work that somebody can only do for themselves. So that's why I wrote a book about it. And that's why I talk about it all the time is I like to let people know like, hey, this possibility exists. Like if you've been saying I love drama and kind of joking about it, you can actually get off on that and change that. (laughs) Um, You know, like just putting that out there, but people have to do the work themselves. Like nobody, I can't rescue anybody from what they're doing. So in that sense, we are all responsible for doing the work. So just like this woman who took it on herself to do this existential kink work and changed her whole career around because she got off on the sexism that she had experienced instead of just like sitting around being like, those awful men, I hate this, this, uh," you know, which most of us do. That's like the default is just to kind of complain and blame other people and everything like that. She did something radically different and that radically changed her results. And um, yeah, so Whereas also if she had just like blamed herself, like, oh, it was my fault for wearing those sexy dresses or I shouldn't have done this, you know, that doesn't go anywhere either. Blame goes nowhere positive. Yeah, that makes total sense. One of the things I like to ask everybody I interview is I'm just a big fan of everybody having some sort of daily magical practice. And I like to hear what different people do. So I'm just curious what your magical practice is like. I'm assuming there's lots of existential kink, but do you do it daily? And what sorts of other things do you incorporate? Ah, yes, I do do existential kink daily. I usually do it in the evening. I do a lot of other stuff. And the other stuff that I do tends to rotate. So right now I do sitting meditation. So just like observing the breath and noticing what I'm thinking and saying thinking to myself and then returning my attention to the breath. Because I find that that's so helpful right now, especially with all this chaos going on. It's very easy for the mind to spin out all this stuff. And I like to just clear my mind, return to the breath. So that's a very important practice that I do lately. In terms of coagula practices, I have always really loved planetary magic. And that's one of the things that I teach because, you know, visualization is awesome, but again, it can be a little bit abstract. And what I love about planetary magic and making talismans is it's very tangible. It's very concrete. You don't have to be great at visualizing things. You can just, you know, do a ritual at at a good time with a planetary deity with the right correspondences and create a really beautiful coagula. So I do love that. That's an ongoing part of what I do. I do a lot with tarot. So I pull a tarot card every day and then I try to pay attention throughout the day to what happens and how I feel. And then at night I record that and I reflect on its relationship with the card So that helps me create a personal relationship with the tarot. And then every once in a while I do, you know, divinatory tarot spreads, Celtic crosses, things like that. Oh boy, what else do I do, magically speaking? I do, uh, so there's work associated with an organization called the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn which was an organization that existed around the turn of the the 20th century from the um, 19th century into the 20th century in London. And it was a briefly lived organization. It existed for about 10 years, but it became the fountain that led to so much of the occult renaissance in the 20th century and even now in the 21st century. So I do some practices connected with that and it's a funny story about how I came to do those practices. Well, I think it's funny because the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, while a venerable institution, is not hip by any stretch of the imagination. So, you know, witchcraft is very hip now. There's all sorts of things that people get into with grimoire magic, Solomonic magic, African diasporic religions. Anyways, all of those are about a billion times more cool than the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. But I started having dreams where I was basically at these astral meetings. <laughs> and I was being um, told, you know, 
hey, you belong to this order, you should start practicing. So that was a very deep experience for me. And they actually, there's a term for that. It's called inner planes contacts. And I was kind of bowled over when I realized that I had those. So I do um, a few practices. One is called the Kabbalistic Cross. One is called the Lesser Banishing Ritual of the Pentagram. And one is called the Middle Pillar. And those are sort of standard, classic, golden dawn practices that I find very grounding and very helpful in staying in touch with my larger self. Mm. Very nice. I'll have to say that you get credit for changing my magical practice because I've always been kind of more leaning towards, you know, the meditations, visualizations, and the abstract. And until I took your influence class, I resisted forever doing daily offerings or really offerings at all. I had altars all over my house, but I don't know what I thought I was accomplished. Mm -hmm. I mean, I did meditate with them, but I never gave offerings. And I was just like, I don't need to do that. And then once I took your class and part of that class was doing the daily offerings, I was like amazed at kind of the change and the connections that that made with, um, well, with the planetary deities I worked with, but with the nature spirits around me. And it's like, it just... I guess with us being physical beings, I really had to go through that practice and learn that discipline of doing it to see what a, what a difference doing actual physical offerings. And that's just a huge part of my practice. So I thank you for that because I don't think, I don't know, it's always the things that we resist the most, I think, <laughs> that make the most change in our life when we finally do it. And for some reason, for years, I kept saying, that's dumb. I don't need to do that. And then once I did, I was like, okay, I get it now. <laughs> well, I am so honored to have introduced that to you, Michelle, in a way that motivated you to do it. And it's a fantastic gift you're giving me because as you're talking, I'm remembering that I actually have slowed down my practice of giving offerings. I have not been giving daily offerings for a while. And I actually consciously stopped doing that about a year ago because things were moving too fast for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, this is too much magic too quickly. <laughs> Need to slow down. But now I'm ready for things to speed up again. And you're reminding me that offerings are one of the very fastest ways to do that. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you for introducing me to offerings. And that's nice to know too, that that's something like if things get sped up too fast that we can pull back and do a little bit less. Oh yeah. Very, it, it is important, I think, to pull back from time to time because this is a funny thing. I think I've talked about this a few times in Influence, but it's actually, it's possible when you start doing this kind of work, when doing the solve and the coagula, and you find that you can really dramatically change your life very quickly. Within a very short time, I went from being broke and single and miserable and like in and out of these super yucky relationships with abusive guys and feeling mostly sorry for myself all of the time to making hundreds of thousands of dollars, being happily married, having a lovely house, traveling around the world, <laughs> and then being pregnant and having a baby, all of this. And so it was like, all of this amazing, great change really fast, but that's a lot to integrate in itself when you receive what you asked for. It's like, oh my gosh, okay, now I have this relationship. What do I do here? <laughs> so I really, I had to like spend a lot of time like not doing manifestation magic and learning how to do the magic of intimacy. And anyways, that, that was an interesting thing. And I, I talk about that in my love course, but yeah, if just taking time to integrate and slowing down can be a valuable thing too. Yeah, that makes sense. I kind of experienced that through, I can't remember if it was influence, but one of the courses where we had something we're focusing on and my husband and I, we were like, we grew up, I guess, both in families where communication was not a thing that happened. And so neither one of us were really good. And one of the things that I worked with or worked on was improving our connection and our intimacy. 
And then when it happened really fast, I was like, whoa. And I realized that I was actually more comfortable with the way things were (laughs) that I said I didn't like. And when I got what I want, it was kind of overwhelming. Oh, so so overwhelming. I I mean, that's (laughs) the reason why you prevented yourself from having it before, right? (laughs) Right. Yeah. I was like, oh, this is what I want. And it feels so uncomfortable. So I guess, yeah, we have to grow into being that person who has those things that we want to have. And yeah, if you do it too fast, it can be. So I wanted to ask, and I think you kind of mentioned this a little bit when you're talking about like, if you were talking with small kids that you might just teach them, it's being grateful for everything. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of one of those woo-woo mommies, the witchy mommy. My kids have been like, I taught them EFT as kids and Sedona method and the work. And I taught them Reiki and mantras and all that kind of stuff. But you know, my 20 year old, she actually has the book and she loves it. And she forced all of her college buddies when they were on their little road trip recently to listen to the audio book in the car. She's like, everybody needs this. And I'm like, I really think that these kinds of shadow integration skills are really good for, you know, people to learn, you know, at a certain level, obviously, you know, EK might be a little bit risque. Mm -hmm. (laughs) young kids, but do you have like maybe a process of doing something similar or during one of the other techniques from your book that you think would help kids kind of get on this path of knowing that, you know, they can be grateful with everything and they don't have to shame themselves for things that happen in their lives? Oh, that's such a wonderful question. You know, I think I'm I'm going to get more advanced with this as my daughter grows up because she's a little baby right now. Mm -hmm. But we, I do have stepsons and pretty much the way that we (laughs) do this with them, they are like six and 10. And so one of the great tools of existential kink and one of the great tools of existential kink coaching is very loving teasing. So my husband will do this with me, for example, like I'll be, I'll get stressed out about something. I'll be like, oh, I don't know how we're going to do this. The tax, the accountant told me that we had so much more to pay in taxes than he told me last week. And blah, blah, blah. I'll just like, I'll get like, really, <laughs> you know, and he'll be like, oh yeah, it's so terrible. We're probably going to lose everything. We'll have to scramble to find a way to live. <laughs> you know, he'll, let, he'll tease me out of it. And likewise with, um, with the boys, you know, let me think of an example. One of them be like, this sucks, you know, like it's anyways, but they're just like, whenever we hear them whining about something like, Oh, I don't like this. This is so horrible. We're just like, yeah, it's terrible. (laughs) We add, Oh God, it's the worst. It's the worst thing that could be happening. It's so awful, (laughs) but it's basically just like agreeing with them in a celebratory way. And, you know, it can take exactly the right tone. It can take some practice to get it right to where they don't feel like you're, you know, being mean and teasing them. But that's the art of it. There's an art to it of teasing somebody in such a way that they become aware of how they are either enjoying their suffering, you know, or Mm -hmm. creating the suffering that they're enjoying, usually some combination of both. And yeah, I feel like I'll, I'll have a better explanation of that in a few years as I have more practice <laughs> with my daughter. Yeah, totally. But I'm going to use that because I get so much high school drama in my life right now. And I can, it's one of those ones where we talked about before, like, I can see you guys are enjoying this, but you can't see that you're enjoying it. <laughs> so I guess that's the trick just to kind of lightly let them enjoy it. Yeah, well, to let yeah, lightly and lovingly and also I think it's from a place of being really grounded like you holding the awareness that they are a super powerful being who generates everything. So, I don't know, Michelle, do you want to give me an example of something you've heard recently from your kids' high school drama? Oh, um, well, I guess one of the things that we come back on like is Nobody wants to be my friend. That's a big one. Mm, mm, Everybody hates me, you know. (laughs) 
Yeah. Yeah. So, so just talking with them and like, and holding the knowledge that, uh, that's, (laughs) that, that some part of them enjoys feeling rejected and that it's amazing to enjoy rejection and just like talking to them from that place of, of being accepting of exactly what they're doing while still being aware of, of how powerful they are. I mean, that's, Oh God, rejection is one of the most delightful things in the world. (laughs) Such an exquisite feeling of powerlessness and of like putting my worth in somebody else's hands for it to be determined outside of me. Oh God, that is, it's just endlessly fun and absorbing. Yeah. (laughs) I guess that's why so many of us keep sticking with that one. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that's one of the problems with existential kink is when you actually get off on something, then it stops. (laughs) Yeah, one of those lovely paradoxes. Yeah, and then you find yourself missing it. Like, oh man, (laughs) I used to be able to entertain myself endlessly with this thing, and now I have to find something else to do? What? I know, that's crazy. Well, I have like one more question that I wanted to bring up before we go. So I'm a fan of Lynn McTaggart, and I don't know if you... um, are familiar with her, but she did the um, intention experiment. I know she had at least one book on that. And basically, so it was a big group of people who would participate in having the same intention. Like they would be like, okay, I'm going to, we're going to lower the pollution in a particular lake, or we're going to lower the crime rate in a certain city. And I think they would even like all come on at the same time and do it or just, you know, focus. And then they would, I think they actually had like people tracking like what happened after they would do it so many times and she got good results, but I'm kind of wondering like if EK or some other type of shadow integration might be helpful for us to do for not just for our, like our own problems in our lives, but for like society's ills, like, um, if we personally could, or we could get a group of people to like do EK on the coronavirus situation or climate change or something like that. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that? What do you think? If that something that would. Yeah, I love that. And I have been definitely thinking specifically about EK in relation to the coronavirus, because I think, yeah, the coronavirus is such a fascinating experience of consciousness right now. Um, so I do think it is possible to do that. I think, I guess what I get a little bit nervous about is people, especially spiritually oriented people, you know, they really want to rush to be altruistic sometimes. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Guilty. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that the most potent change for most people really begins with, you know, being able to get off on and, do solve and coagula on their own personal stuff. And so once you've done it on your, on a lot of your own personal stuff, then I think would be really the time to start turning attention to the global level. But of course, here's the magical, really beautiful thing is anytime you get off on something. So nothing is absolutely unique to us, right? Like no scarcity, no rejection, no racism, sexism, trauma that we've experienced is unique to us. So whenever we succeed in getting off on and making conscious a previously unconscious enjoyment, we make it that much easier for other people likewise to do the same. It's sort of like, right, there was, I'm forgetting the guy's name, but for a long time, people thought it was impossible to run a mile in four minutes. And then in the 1980s, a guy did it. And then suddenly tons of people were able to run a mile in four minutes. And it's kind of like that with existential kink. Like you succeed in being brave and shameless and courageous enough to really get off on, let's say, your personal enjoyment of the coronavirus and all of the fear it creates and the grief and the stress and the delight of society shutting down if you can get off on that, it makes it so much easier for other people to get off on it. So you open that doorway in consciousness. And um, yeah, 
So if I were to lead a large scale existential kink practice, as I might do in connection with coronavirus, I'm not going to be asking people to get off on the global situation so much as I'm going to be asking them to get off on precisely the way that it affects them. Right. So just because it's really at that level that we need the transformation but I think you are definitely on to something wonderful, Michelle. And I'm hoping, you know, as the existential kink book gets more popular and circulates and that this idea becomes more mainstream because it is pretty weird. I think it's going to take a little <laughs> while for it to, <laughs> you know, become a popular topic, but I believe it will. And once it will, I am definitely interested in exploring those sort of larger collective shadow work issues. Yeah, that makes sense that even just if everybody focuses on their own enjoyment of those issues, instead of trying to focus on all of society's enjoyment, it makes more sense that that would be helpful to us personally. And like you said, then we're helping other people get to that level as well. Yes, absolutely. Well, it has been so lovely talking to you. And I am so glad that you wrote this book because I'm always trying to tell people a little bit about how to do this because I think it's so helpful and it's been so helpful to me in my life. And so now I can just say, here, get the book. And so I'm really glad that you wrote the book. And so I'm going to be sharing links in the show notes to where they can get the book. And you also have a Facebook group, right? If they've read the book that they can join in and chat with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's an Existential Kink Facebook group and you can just search for it. Search Existential Kink in your Facebook bar and the group should come up and you can just request join. And I have a website, which is carolyngraceelliot.com and Elliot has two L's, two T's. There you can um, join my email list. And after you've joined my email list, I send you for free the first three chapters of the book. And you can also hear much more about my courses and my programs, which I pretty much announce just to my email list. I announce them on my social media too, but that's the easiest way to find out about them. And I also am pretty active on Instagram. I'm at Carolyn Elliott underscore. And I, I share daily there just sort of existential kink perspectives on things. And yeah, I'm, I hope that folks listening do go out and check out the book. And I love that story about your daughter having her friends listen to it. I think the audible is really fun. And if you don't have much time to sit and read, if you just want to listen to something while you wash the dishes, like I do, <laughs> I do recommend mm -hmm. the book. It's, it's a good time. Yeah. I have, I have both the print version and the audible and yeah, the audible version is really delightful. And I'll tell everyone that Carolyn does read it and she just uh, brings a lot of charm to it. So I've really enjoyed it. Thank you, Michelle. You're welcome. So everything will be in the show notes. All those links that you mentioned will be there. And yeah, everybody go get the book. It is definitely a life-changing practice. And I really thank you for coming on, Carolyn. And it was just really fun to chat with you. Thank you, Michelle. You're welcome. Have a great one. You too. <laughs>